to uh, North Carolina. We're very excited to have you here. And uh, let's open with a prayer. Would you mind? No. I'd like to offer the prayer. David, would you do that? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this chance to be here. We thank thee for Brother Phil Pop traveling out to talk with us. And we pray that we'll all have our thinking caps on, and that our hearts will be open, that what we discuss will touch and help each of us, uh, help us mentally and help us prepare physically, and most importantly, help us to start to put our priorities together spiritually. We thank Thee for Thy Spirit, and we ask Thee to please bless us with it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Should we go ahead and eat, or should we wait? It's up, who's going to vote? Um, I think you're in charge. Okay. <laughs> I would say go ahead and make a plate, and then we'll sit down and just eat while we start. Okay. And I would request you just be mindful of the white upholstery. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think she's talking to me because I'm sitting. <laughs> can we eat while we listen? Yes. So that we can. Here, I'll, break, I'll go ahead and get the plates. I know exactly how to do it. you just fly in today? Oh, is that where you live now, or you just came? So we went. I brought my son, and we went to Tennessee and Atlanta. And then he said he would go to Florida. He said if you if you go to Florida with me, I'll go with you. So you flew into Tennessee. So we flew to Atlanta. Huge mistake. Don't ever do that. <laughs> and then drove to Tennessee. Drove back to Atlanta. Another huge mistake. And this time, unfortunately, passed through. And well, so we did a presentation in Jefferson, Atlanta, Georgia, Jefferson, Georgia. And I've never seen anything like that college around there in my life. You know, on one night, the night that my son said, we were at Waffle House. So we drive down to the Waffle House. That's a highlight. And the streets were lined with kids. College kids. I mean, it's probably St. Patrick's Day. But I think you know, it's a mile of kids at bars and restaurants. Just hanging out. Just hanging out. And I, was, I mean, I went to Rick's College, right? So right. That, was, that was shocking. <laughs> so we, we leave there, we go out to eat. And maybe if I was taking her to Florida, so we went down to Florida. And then we went to New Orleans Temple. Because he wanted to go to the temple. That was crazy. Yeah. Did your son here tonight? No, he was not. So he, he left. And then I came here, and then yeah. I'm going to roll over to yeah. sister's place. Okay. Wow. Awesome. And then I go back to Raleigh, flying by the salt and something. You want some food? No. I, no. I'm, I'm old. I get congestion now, you know. Sadly. Well, we are too, but we're going to eat. Well, I want to know, when did you start... Um, Making the connection that to help these people connect the dots. When, how far back does that go for you? So really, COVID. COVID. I'd say prior okay. to COVID, I was just a contrarian. Right? I was, I was a, um, I was prideful in my ability to know something somebody else did not, and love to know things. And the, I didn't, controversies never bothered me. No, not in a conversation, right? I, I don't really get mad when people dialogue. Right. And I don't mind heated dialogue. Right. And, and my family is like that. We, we argue, we, we appear heated to our in laws, but we're not. And Good debate. So, but 2020, I'd say COVID was kind of a humbling moment. Okay. And a recognition that. I no, I just have a book. <laughs> My daughter used to do like that. How real should I make everything? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Because it's it's not hard for for me to intellectualize 
lies away the, the reality of the second coming. I could, I could intellectualize it into a parable. Okay. You know? Yeah. And so I kind of have to decide do I really believe that Jesus is real? Or is really coming? Is, is there really an Adam and Eve? Is that a Is the temple for real? Is that just a symbolic motif? You know? Right. And, and I'd, always, I'd always answer on the side yes, it is real. But I felt like in 2020, I really had to make a decision if I believe that. Yeah. yeah. Do I want to believe that? And, and not really is the church true, but I don't know how to explain it. It was like this moment where I decided that I wanted it all to be true. Mm. And when I realized that I wanted it to be true, that seemed different than the people it was true. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, it, there's a different mindset when you say you believe and when you decide that you, you know. I looked at it and I said, you know, even if it's not, I still want that to be true because it's so good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if there is no Christ, I want there to be one that I would do whatever it took to work to make sure sometime in the future when we overcome time and space, there is one. And when you overcome time and space, then there always was one. Anyway, but you know what I mean? Like, it yeah. was kind of that, like, I like it. I like that philosophy. I embrace the philosophy. And so now I'm not just a person who believes it has a testimony, like, of the way. Yeah. That, that's probably what it is. Did you feel like, because um, there was a pivot moment for me, like when the temples, all temples are closed, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, this is real. This is, we no longer have the ability to worship the way we took for granted, right? right. In America, too. In right? America. So, so yeah. you have two, two windows being shattered. My religion is stopped, and the thing I thought about my country doesn't appear to be true. Anymore. Yeah. Because my country wouldn't do that. Right. But here it is doing it. <laughs> and it's happening. Yeah. Right. Where all of those things where revelation was just, I, it really is happening in my lifetime. It, it becomes real now. All of a sudden, when you're seeing, boom, 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 prophecies being fulfilled. Yeah. And and the worst part is, is now that they've done it once. It can right. happen they again. They know it, yeah. So, that was a precursor. <laughs> yeah. This is how it feels, and what are you going to do about it? We, you're going to, I will say things, I'll, I'll say twice. So, um, we went into martial law in Utah. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard, and I was trying to figure out how, how that was. Trigger mechanisms in law. You Statutory, we went into martial law in Utah. Yeah. Who was that? For two years. During COVID. During COVID. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And almost nobody knew it. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, you can't really find a whole lot of it. Right. So, how how do you, what do you do with your, well, I'm, I'm jumping the gun off. I know. <laughs> Sorry about this. Okay, you want me to start? Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, no. we're going to go ahead and get started. So, eat and enjoy. Morgan's going to go ahead and get started. All right. Um, I have, a, I have a supernatural ability to talk for very extended amounts of time. And, yeah, <laughs> I apologize in advance, especially to the young people in the room. I don't know how you two got coaxed into being here, but I just apologize. <laughs> your mother's either the most amazing person or your sister, mother. What? Whoa. Whoa. Okay. So either the most amazing or cruel person in the world. One of those two, I'm not sure which. Um, how old are you two? I'm 18. I'm 16. How tall are you? 6'3". All right, we have Nephi in the back here. It's <laughs> amazing. Um, I'll try to make this somewhat entertaining for you two. Do you have your mother? Yeah, so is it not working? No, it's not on. No, it's not on mic. Oh, it's just, it's just on that. Oh. Oh. Um, so, if, if, I, if I'm talking too much, please just, you know, interrupt with a question. Feel free to go get food, leave. I, I'm, I'm okay with that, and I apologize in advance for my <laughs> long-windedness. Um, I, I started doing this in 2020. 
1997, uh, actually one more thing. Has anybody actually never heard one of my presentations before? Okay. All right. Anybody have absolutely no idea who I am? And I'm okay with that too. Okay. I'm from Utah. Uh, and uh, in, uh, so I'll go back to a little history. In 1997, as a young kid in college, I decided to go to an internship. And my internship uh, was out of the University of Utah to Washington, D.C. at the Clinton White House Council on Environmental Quality. I was a young uh, environmental studies major at the University of Utah. And I, had, I was so ignorant of politics that at the time I did not see myself as either a Democrat or a Republican. I, I have no party affiliation. I had not been raised in a political household. So when I went to the Clinton White House, I didn't know what to expect. And I was also so Mormon, like such a young, such a, an ignorant LDS kid, that the first time I remember seeing the chairwoman of the Council on Environmental Quality on the phone with Al Gore, she was dropping the F-bomb over and over and over. Now, for, for those of you who are, you know, experienced in life, you, you recognize in Washington, D.C., or if you've been around the law, that's not unusual at all. But for me, as a young LDS guy, that was unusual. And I was actually very shocked by it, because I thought that at the highest levels of American government, there was this decorum that existed. Right. And so that kind of shattered that view. And I, I don't know why, but for some reason I went, and this is not what I thought it would be. And not to mention, anybody follow Utah politics? I know this. But th this is an interesting moment in American history that touches upon American politics and Utah politics. Out, out west, we have huge swaths of land that are owned or controlled by the federal government. You probably don't have that here. Do you guys know how much of your land is controlled by the federal government, North Carolina? About 3 percent. How much? Three percent. So ours is 87% in Utah. And in, uh, while I was an intern at the Clinton White House, Bill Clinton had designated the largest monument national monument in the history of the United States, and it was called the Escalante Monument, and he had done it in secret. And Jim Hansen, who was the congressman from Utah, was very upset about this. He had subpoenaed documents from the Clinton White House, and, and those documents that he subpoenaed that were being withheld from Utah were sitting in the office of the press secretary up on a shelf, and I got to go through those as part of my research paper for my internship. So, you know, you kind of, you shattered the wall, of, they shattered the wall of decorum for me, and then they also, for the first time I realized that there were conspiracies going on in the government, which again, you know, you think, well, who doesn't know that? Well, for me, this was kind of the first moment that I saw an actual kind of conspiracy unfold in front of my eyes. Now, it was, it was a little one, I, I would, well, maybe, it depends on how you look at that, but, uh, that would caused me to go into politics. I went home and, as you can imagine, I decided I wasn't a Democrat. I decided I was a Republican. Uh, I went home to Utah. I ran for the Utah legislature. I served two terms in the Utah legislature before taking off to law school. And while I was there, uh, President Faust, you guys remember him, shows up at the Utah legislature. He's in the back room. He's come to say a prayer. And, and the, the Democrat minority leader in Utah's legislature walks up to him and says, President Faust, I understand you used to be a Democrat. And he goes like this, he goes, and he was, he was a, he was a young Democrat in the Utah House. He said, I have risen above such things. And that really kind of profoundly struck me. It stayed with me all of my life as I tried to comprehend what he meant. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but for somebody who is kind of a a gospel. I'm a, I'm a Mormon mutt, right? I, I'm not related to anybody important. Nobody that I'm related to has ever done anything very important. And um, so to meet him was, was pretty profound, and that really s stuck with me, and I wondered, well, you know, what does he mean? Does that mean he's an apostle now, and I'm just kind of a Mormon layperson? 
Or is he saying something more profound there? <clears throat> so, um, I stayed in law and politics uh, for, God, let's see, after that for, you know, two decades. And in 2016, when I decided to finally get out of politics, I got a call from a guy named Ryan Bundy. Anybody follow the Bundys? Not Ted Bundy, not the serial killer. You know who I'm talking about, the ranchers? I don't know who follow them. Did you follow those cases? Oh, uh, yeah. So Ammon, Cliven, and Ryan, and Davey Bundy, and Mel Bundy are brothers, father and brothers. And Cliven Bundy has a bunch of cows on federal property in the state of Nevada. And in 2014, the United States government decided to do a cattle impoundment operation, went down to Nevada, and set up an operation to take the cows of Cliven Bundy and to seize them. And Cliven staged a protest with his sons. Now, anybody ever been to Nevada? We're from, driven the, we're from Southern Utah, St. George, so oh, we know nice. I'm from Las Vegas. Vegas. Pretty well. What's your last name? New Claus. Yeah. <laughs> I just wonder if I knew any of your family down there. I've been down there quite a bit. Uh, so, you know the road from St. George to Vegas, you drive through Bunkerville. Mm -hmm. This guy's literally out in the middle of nowhere, and the government sets up this big operation. And the Bundys come forward and they say, hey, we, we got a little problem here. The U.S. government has brought snipers, um, paramilitary operations. They've set up surveillance devices around our house. They are pointing lasers at us. And the government says, you're lying. And, and not only are you lying, you have lied about this in order to entice people to come and support you in defiance of the federal government, and so they started to threaten prosecution and arrest. Well, they didn't arrest them. The government set up a big old impoundment gate. The protesters all came down to the impoundment gate, and both sides had guns. Like, can you imagine going to a protest and taking your guns with you? That's what the Bundys and their supporters had done. So the whole world is looking at this saying, of course, that the Bundys, these cowboys, are crazy. And who would do that, right? Who would bring these guns and, and confront the federal government as if you're going to have a standoff and shoot each other? Well, nobody got arrested. Everybody went home. And about a year and a half later, the Bundys showed up again in Oregon and took over a federal wildlife refuge out in the middle of nowhere, Oregon, and held another protest with a bunch of people. Okay, so you look at this and imagine what the mainstream news is saying about this. Domestic terrorism on the rise in the West. Here's the poster children for domestic terrorism, these LDS ranchers from <laughs> Nevada. Right, just exactly what the church needs is you know, crazy right-wing guys. Well, what's interesting about this is um, the government prosecuted them after the second protest. They arrested them in Oregon. They put them in jail for almost two years. And uh, I got a phone call from Ryan saying, will you come and represent me or my brother in Oregon? for the first trial. So we put together a legal team, we went over to Oregon, we had a team, not, this was not my team, our team was three people. But the total lawyer team for all the defendants was 26 different lawyers for about, I think, 13 or 14 different defendants. And what happened was we sat down, anybody actually go to law school? study law. Um, one of the first things you learn at law school is you cannot adversely possess. Do you know what that term adverse possession is where if you own some property and you're not using it and I come over and start to use it and I put a fence around it and I hold it long enough, it's mine. You lose it. That's called adverse possession. Well, you can't do that to the government. Okay, so the first thing we say is that we're going we're gonna to use that legal doctrine to win this case in Oregon. 
and all the attorneys said, you're crazy, your clients are going to go to jail, and they walked away from us, except for seven of the defendants. Well, we won. We won the case by a unanimous jury trial in Oregon. They, uh, in the, I'm, I'm really going to summarize this real short, uh, because it's, it's a huge saga. After we won, and if you can imagine this is a courtroom, right, right up here is where the judge sits. This is the area where the attorneys come up and argue. You know, the, the attorneys will sit back there. And, and the area where the attorneys sit is called the bar. You have to go past the bar. That's why you pass the bar. You come in past the bar. You sit in the attorney area. But to come up here, you have to have the judge's permission. It's called the well. Well, my attorney, my attorney partner stood up right over here after we had won, and he started to make the argument that our client, Ammon Bundy, must be free to go, right? Because can you imagine if you were a defendant being held by the United States government, you've just been found innocent unanimously by a jury, and the government says, well, hold on, we're not going to let you go. Can the government hold you without order? No. So my partner was calling them out for this. You can't take him. You don't have a detention and transfer order. So the U.S. Marshal stood up, went to my partner, tackled him, tased him, and arrested him. Now, this was like, this had entered the realm of absolute total craziness. This uh, happened in the courtroom. This happened in the courtroom, right in front of the judge. After she told them to sit down, they still advanced on him, tased him, and arrested him. Because we were exposing that they had, were about to do something illegal. Now, now that's just the, that is the thing that cracked open this entire event, which would lead to my completely leaving the practice of law by 2020. Because what happens thereafter is we then went to Nevada, where the original incident happened, and we had a judge who was appointed by Barack Obama and Harry Reid dismiss the case with prejudice for outrageous prosecutorial misconduct. Now the reason she did this is because we had proven that since 2014 the federal government had been lying compulsively to both courts had been entrapping the Bundys. Remember how they came down with their guns and faced off in 2014 at the first thing? Guess who convinced all those people to come and support the Bundys? It was the United States government. They had set up an operation in a town called Mesquite, Nevada, where they had rented an entire hotel, set up a fake social media operation, and enticed the craziest possible people they could find to come to Nevada and support the Bundys. Now that's just the beginning of what we proved in Nevada. There was also a whistleblower letter that was written by a guy named Larry Wooten, who was one of the lead investigators for the federal government, who said it was one of the largest instances of federal corruption within the Office of Law Enforcement Services that he had ever seen in his career. We found pictures of the United States government training attack dogs to attack protesters before there was a protest and before there were any protesters. We had an FBI agent admit to the judge that they had purposefully concealed evidence for over three years that would show that our clients were innocent. After that happened, not only did my partner get arrested, they went after our bar licenses through the office of, uh, through the Justice Department's Office of Professional Conduct and tried to get us disbarred in every state we practiced in. Now, interestingly, uh, I, won't, I won't go into all that, I didn't come here to tell you that. I, I give you that background because that was the thing that in 2020, once COVID hit, I looked at all that and said, I'm done, and this COVID thing is really suspicious and really weird from the perspective of a guy who has been practicing in law and politics for 23 years by that point in time. I was approached by a group of mothers and fathers to file a lawsuit in the state of Utah against the state of Utah at that point in time, 2020, 
for denying children what they considered to be their constitutional right to attend public schools. In Utah, we actually have a provision in the Constitution that guarantees a child right to a free and public education. And so I, I looked at them and I said, there's no way I'm going to do this for you. And they, you know, kind of responded, well, please, nobody else will do it, right? You may remember the Mikey commercials. <laughs> Get Mikey to do it if he likes anything. That, that was me. And I said, I'm not going to do this. And, and one of the things I said to him is I said, look, do you really think that if I file a lawsuit for you in the state of Utah, that this worldwide event, right? Because COVID was a worldwide event. Do you really think this worldwide event is just going to be like, okay, well, Morgan Philpott filed a lawsuit in Utah, and, and they're right, so let's stop the whole thing. Right? That wasn't going to happen. So I had to kind of wrestle with what is happening. What is COVID? Right? What, and, and ask yourself for a second, like go back to 2020, what nation in the world did not support COVID protocols? Is it Scandinavia? There's maybe uh, there was one over there that wouldn't do the contact tracing. Yeah, Norway or something. And what did they call it? They were going to allow immunity by. But but other than that, almost the entire world united under the COVID protocols. Now now. As a secondary thought, think of how crazy that is. Not, not crazy because you shouldn't have done it. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying think about how crazy that is in context of world history. When is the last time the entire world united for anything? War. And, and even then, the, the mo probably the most um, unifying war we ever fought, I would probably argue, is World War II. And we were not unified as a world. So COVID for me was a really interesting experience. And I said to, the, to these parents, I said, look, I'll do that. So can I ask you a question? Sure. The parents were wanting to sue the state of Utah. The state of Utah because the kids were not able to go to school because yes. they closed out. The so, well, okay. not necessarily. So you got six kids in a room. This kid's sick. This kid's not. But you got within six feet of that kid. So now you're on the list and you're kept out even though you don't have COVID. Yeah. And what they were arguing is that's a denial of your right to go because you've done nothing wrong and you don't have the thing that would make you a hazard. So I said, I'll, I'll file the lawsuit if we can sit down and talk for six hours and I'm going to tell you what I think is happening because by this time I had made the decision that I was going to preach the gospel and not do law and politics anymore. And they said, okay, which was a surprise to me. And this is where I learned in 2020 as I go through this motions of preparing this lawsuit, this is where I learned that Utah had actually gone into martial law. And that what had caused Utah to go into martial law was a series of trigger, statutory trigger mechanisms. So, so what, do you, what do you do with that, right? As somebody who had spent their entire adult life in law and politics and was now officially done with all that, what do you do? Right? I have to kind of come to grips with some things. Do I, do I reset my career? Do I really believe in my religion? And if I really believe in my religion, what is going on in the world today? Now that's, that's to me, that question is not as profoundly in my heart and mind today as it was in 2020. For some reason in 2020, that was a very profound consideration for me. And I had to ask myself, one, do I, do I really believe in this notion that Christ will come again? Okay, now, now that may sound a little trite, okay, because I, I kind of think as a, as a Christian people, as an LDS people, we have made the second coming kind of a trite thing. I don't think we really believe it, honestly. I, I think we believe it in the sense that it's kind of a tenet of our faith, but it's not real. Right? When, I, when I live my life every day, I'm not going to work thinking I'm doing this because Jesus is coming. Right? That's, but, but isn't, I mean, think about this. This is what kind of hit me as I was going through this process. 
Right? When you think about Christ as the fundamental tenet of our faith, the fundamental person, the fundamental principle, how many times does he show up according to our theology? Show up on the earth? Yeah, like guaranteed. If, if he, maybe, let me rephrase it. Guaranteed, you know, I would argue there's two times he's going to be here. Guaranteed. And if you're at the right place at the right time, you will literally see him. One was the first coming, right? Right. So he's born, he grows up, he starts a ministry, they kill him. If you caught him in that 34 year window, you literally got to see him. What's the second? Second coming, right? So, so I'm like, well, God, if, if that's for real, what's more important? And then I start to comprehend that, I think it's Alma in the Book of Mormon where he struggles with this moment where he says, I've got to quit politics. Because politics has no power to change anybody. And, and the, you know, I would actually argue the Book of Mormon teaches that. So let me let me show you something. Ether chapter eight. Take a look at this statement that Mormon makes. Mormon is grappling with the fall of two two nations. One is the the, the Jaredite nation. And the other is the Nephite nation. And look at what he says. Well, let me show you this one first. They, the secret combinations, have caused the destruction of this people, of whom I am now speaking, the Jaredites, and also the destruction of the people of Nephi. Okay, so that's basically the context of why he's going through this kind of dissertation to us, the Gentiles, about the problem with these secret combinations. Now look at what he says about the secret combinations. They were kept up by the power of the devil to administer the oaths to who? Okay, now that seems backwards. If I'm going to create a secret society of a bunch of people who get together in black robes with curved daggers and meet in a dark room, what would that have to do with the people? We're going to administer the oath to the people in the black robes in the dark room with the curved daggers. But Mormon says, no, these things were kept up to administer the oath to the people to do what to the people? To keep the people in darkness to help who? The people who are making the, the deals. To help the people who have entered into these secret combinations. And what are the, what's the purpose of the combination? Power, murder, plunder. Lying and whoredom. So how am I going to administer these oaths to people? Propaganda. Okay, propaganda. Media. How, how do you get everybody? Yeah. Pandemic. You know how I would do it? <coughs> Schools. Yeah. I'd make sure that everybody went to a school where you couldn't teach Jesus. And if you brought up Jesus as a teacher, you get in trouble. You try to pray with the kids, you get in trouble. Try to teach from your scriptures, you get in trouble. But if you eliminate religion from your beliefs, we'll allow you to plaster those all over the wall. Right Now, I'm not necessarily against anybody saying what they want, but when I get a captive audience with my beliefs, and I begin to preach my beliefs to that captive audience, you see what I can do? And am I a bad guy for doing that? I don't think I am. Do you really think the people who do this think they're bad? No, not at all, right? This, this, no, and do we actually have a right to tell a person you can't preach what you believe? See, we say we do, why? Because you've got a captive audience, but how do you really honestly do that? How do you really honestly gag a person no matter what their beliefs are? You see the problem we get ourselves into? We've now got a system set up where depending on which political power is in control, guess what they can do? Gag or free speech. 
And, and that's, now, now analyze Republicans and Democrats from this perspective. Is the Republican Party an organization built up for power? Is the Democrat Party? Yeah. How do you rise in the ranks of these two parties? You get them money through deals. So you go back to Washington, D.C. or to your local state legislature and guess who's exchanging money? It's not just the Democrats. Special interest. Yeah, it's not just the Republicans. It's both sides engaged in what we call graft. We've kind of lost that term from our vocabulary. But it's people taking money so that businesses, and you think these businesses are like meeting in black robes with curved daggers? Or do you think they're just there going, hey, I've got to watch out for my interests? You know, there was a story years ago about P&G and, and, their, and their satanic practices that they would do, uh, you know, with certain members. And I remember that surfacing because I hate stuff like that, and it was just gone. And the same thing's happening now. You see, like, you see stuff surfacing, and it's gone the next day. But I can listen to hours and hours of the other side. And that, and that includes the Fox sometimes, by the way. So it's not that I don't have a loyalty. I'm just not sure where it is. Sure. Well, what we do is we prop up propaganda wings to tell one side of two different stories. I mean, and just think about also this. When is the last time you agreed to be governed by one of only two parties? What do we call that in Mexico? We call it a cartel. How did America become a nation of cartel government? And at what point in time did that happen? And at what point in time did we say that was okay? And how long does that have to go on before we stop even thinking about it all together and we embrace this completely? Because what happens, and this is what the LDS people and other Christians do, is they say, hey, well, we don't murder people. Yeah, we, do we know politicians lie? Absolutely. Do we know politicians commit whoredoms? Do we think most politicians are wicked? Do we know politicians plunder? And that's just the way it goes. So we don't even complain about that anymore. The only thing we complain about is when you start to try to kill people. But now, what have we been doing since 1990? We've waged a never-ending war on terrorism, that's what we call it, outside the United States and inside the United States, and we've been killing people ever since. Now, does either party stand up against killing people? No. They both have waged these wars ever since. <clears throat> now, here's another one. What if you just say to yourself, I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm out. I quit. Well, hold on. First of all, you can't do anything about it as it is, right? Right. Or you can take my route and scream at the TV. Sure. Or you can go to jail because you really want to do something about it. So where are we stuck? We're stuck at, we know they're lying. They're, they know they're lying. They're yeah. telling us they're lying, right? They're telling us to believe it. Yeah. And even us in here, some, so, me in particular, might be believing that crud. Here's where it gets really bad. How many Democrats, Republicans, <clears throat> on the extreme edges of the parties think the other side is morally unconscionable? Both. Both. <laughs> we designed an amendment to the Constitution specifically for those people. What is it? Free speech. Not, yes, but also freedom of conscience and religion. So if I find you to be evil and satanic, guess what I don't have to do? You cannot make me support you. So all I have to do is stop paying my taxes, right? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but do you see what just happened there? I know that Joe Biden has dementia. Other people on the other side know that Donald Trump is a tyrant. Easy, just stop paying your taxes. When they come to get you for not paying your taxes, you have a Second Amendment right. Don't do this, right? <laughs> we don't believe this. 
You can't do these things because if you do, what will happen? You'll be murdered. They will kill you. So we live in a system that is literally built to kill you if you don't comply with the powers that be. And here's what your neighbors say. Well, I wouldn't do it. No, you send the sheriff to get me. No, I don't send the sheriff to get you. You should have just done what they said. So I should have subjected my conscience to moral evil. Yeah, that's what you should have done. And so you get back to the situation, what can I do? And I recognized in 2020, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's game over, right? So if it's game over, watch what, watch what Moroni says, or Mormon. No, it is Moroni, sorry. The Lord commandeth you that when ye shall see these things come among you. Now, now think about how amazing this is right here. If this is not true, okay, Joseph Smith, uh, how old is he at the time? 20-something-year-old kid, is writing this in 1829. That's brilliant. What an amazing kid to see the future of America from this perspective and say, hey, for all of you future generations, you're going to see this exact situation in your future and I want you to know that when you see it, God commands you to awaken to a sense of your awful situation. And if you support this, guess what's going to happen? You will be destroyed completely. All right, now that, amongst many, many other things, is what's going through my mind in 2020. And I recognize in 2020, I've got to come to a point where I make a decision on what I believe and what I'm going to do about it. Now, interestingly, in 2018, in the church, we get a new prophet, President Nelson. And he starts to say stuff like this in 2018. Now think about that, look at the month, look at what he's saying. Is that alarmist or not alarmist? Is that an alarmist statement? I'd say not really, because he adds that word right there. If he said it will not be possible to survive, that would be alarmist. Okay, but he doesn't. He pulls back a little bit, and in April he says it will not be possible to survive without the influence of the Holy Ghost, I plead with you to increase your spiritual capacity to receive revelation. Okay, here's another one. 2018, October, I bless you with the ability to leave the world behind, to prepare the world for the second coming of His beloved Son. Okay, alarmist or not? I'd say no, no not, not so much. Um, I do find it personally refreshing to hear somebody over the pulpit at conference talk about the second coming. Okay, how about this? Time is running out. Alarmist? It's getting a little bit more so. How about this? Rome, this is a hinge point in the history of the church. Things are going to move forward at an accelerated pace. The church is going down an unprecedented future, unparalleled. No, no, maybe not as much as that one, but notice the vein or the philosophy that's starting to come out here with President Nelson. 2020, this is after COVID has started. He gets up and he says, how have current events made you feel about the future? The Lord has spoken of our day in sobering terms. He warned that in our day, men's hearts would fail them. And even the very elect would be at risk of being deceived. He told the prophet Joseph that peace would be taken from the earth and calamities would befall mankind. Alarmist? He would repeat the same prophetic admonition in April. We live in a time prophesied long ago when all things shall be in commotion and surely men's hearts shall fail them. That was true before the pandemic, and it will be true after commotion will continue to increase. 
this one gets a little bit more hard for me to... This seems pretty alarmist to me. It did, it did seem very alarmist to me when I first heard this. He gets up in front of the women in October at women's conference, says Moroni helped them create areas where they would be safe, places of security, he called them. Similarly, as turmoil rages around us, we need to create places where we are safe, both physically and spiritually. This one I thought was kind of blew me away. It is now time that we each implement extraordinary measures, perhaps measures we have make, never taken before, to strengthen our spiritual foundations. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. Then this one, this one, this one really jumped out at me. <coughs> we never needed positive spiritual momentum more than we do now to counteract the speed with which evil and the darker signs of the times are intensifying. Now what is that? What are the evil and darker signs of the times? Okay, let's explore that a little bit. This is Peter. Now think about who Peter is. Is Peter an important guy? Mm -hmm. Do you actually see Peter as an important guy? Or do you see Peter as the guy who denied Christ three times? Because Peter is the right-hand man of the Lord. He's the guy that the Lord puts things on when the Lord is leaving. He's the guy in charge of the twelve who will judge all nations. So this guy is, he knows what he's talking about. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise and coming as some men count slackness, but long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Second Peter 3. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent. So what's Peter's admonition? Be looking, be diligent. Okay, now, this is a really interesting conversation. Matthew 24 is not just found in Matthew 24. And what I mean by that is this conversation right here, did you know it appears in other chapters? Let me show you something real quick. If I can find it. Okay, so Matthew 24, which is a dissertation by the Lord to his apostles, is found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. However, it is also found in modern revelation. Joseph Smith did an interpretation of Matthew 1. So we also have the Matthew 1 account of Matthew 24, and we have DNC 45. So we have five chapters dedicated to the same conversation. Now look at how this conversation starts. Christ comes out of the temple. His disciples say to him, and, and it's hard to, it's, if you don't look at all of them, it's hard to see this. So his disciples came to him for to shew him the buildings of the temple See ye not all these things? Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And the impression that you get, if you don't combine them, is you get the impression that they're disturbed that the temple is going to be thrown down. But really what they are disturbed by is that the Lord has told them the temple will be destroyed, Jerusalem will be raised to the ground, and he will die. You know, why would that be disturbing to them? Yeah, he's the liberator, right? So if you're going to die, what does that mean for Peter, James, John, and all the followers? What's interesting is in one of these verses, he actually says three of the disciples were taken aside. And if you look at the Greek word, the word for disciple is those of mental acuity and strength. So he's revealing this to those who have sufficient mental acuity and strength to understand it. And he lays it out in three different chapters. <clears throat> then we're given the other two. And if you put them together, 
<clears throat> you'll see a pattern. What they're, and you'll see what they're really getting at. And what he's going to do is he's going to walk them through the entire fall of Jerusalem. And then what he's going to say, once all that occurs, the gospel will be preached to all nations. A light will break forth in the latter days, he says. And then he says this. You see that verse right there? <clears throat> Again <coughs> shall the abomination be fulfilled. Okay, so he says, he says to them, he takes them out of the temple. He looks back, he says, see that temple, the whole thing's going down. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill all of you. They're going to hunt down all the saints. They're going to siege Jerusalem. They're going to destroy Jerusalem. There's going to be earthquakes, calamities, uh, all sorts of crazy things. And there will be false Christ. Don't, don't, if they come and say that I'm coming, don't believe them because after they've killed all of us and scattered us throughout all the nations, then the gospel will be preached to all the world and then a light will break forth and then all of this stuff I just told you is going to happen again. So he's laying out the type and sign from his death to the destruction of Jerusalem and then saying to them, and it's going to happen again. And the capstone of all of that destruction is the desolation of abomination, he says, and again, that will be fulfilled. So he basically gives them all this. Now, someday if you get the chance, go put all those together and throw in DNC 45 and line those up. I, I can't do it for you tonight. It'll take too long. And you'll just see this amazing story unfold about the second coming. So what is also really interesting is you've got these three prime apostles, right? Peter, James, and John. And what's the question they want to know? I mean, you got the Lord sitting right in front of you, and the question you want to know is, is what about the next time? And this is a common theme when you explore, the, even in the book of Enoch, where you look at Moses and Abraham, their question is always of this final coming of the Lord in the last days, which, which tells you something about the times in which we live. Okay, now, now why does... Why does all that matter? Now, as, as Latter-day Saints, if you've been to General Conference in the last 23 years, you're going to recognize some of these. False Christ will come. They'll deceive many. Don't go after them. There will be wars and rumors of wars. These things must needs be. There will be commotions, nations rising against nations, earthquakes in diverse places, fearful sights and great signs from the heavens, the desolation of abomination. And then he says this, when you shall see it uh, standing where it ought not, which is a really interesting term because he doesn't really say when you see the desolation of ab abomination completed. He says when you see it standing where it ought not, that's your warning to flee, get out of Judea. Now he goes through all that and then he says and it's all going to happen again in the last days. Okay, but here's, here's one of the clues he gives us. He says, immediately after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, what is the power of heaven? I would argue it's priesthood, or possibly the temple. Because if we, if we look at the power of the priesthood, we tend to associate the priesthood with the power of God, with a masculine identity. And I would argue, I don't, I don't want to try and get into masculine feminine identities within heavenly power, but I wonder if the distinction here is to point out a temple location which involves all divine powers, not just one side. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so if the, the powers of heaven are, I, I would argue, are most plainly manifest in the temple, which is masculine and feminine. And so I would argue that this is a temple uh, interruption, or a, that's not really the word I intended to use, but it's maybe appropriate, uh, that you have a shaking of the temple, the functioning of the temple. <clears throat> Being that it won't function, there'll be a time that it will close? Or not yeah, or perhaps a, a discord, right? 
uh, whatever that shaking means. What does it mean to shake? If, if I were to say to you, the powers of the priesthood shall be shaken, you know, do you think of that differently? So, so I, I think a lot of people look at that and they say, well, I, I don't even know what that means. The powers of heaven. They'll say, well, where do you find the powers of heaven? You find them on earth through keys and at the temple. So it seems to infer to me that we have a combination of the two. The authority of God on earth in two divine places, maybe one, are going to be in some way shaken. Which I would say is a disruption. <clears throat> so he says this will happen after the tribulation. Well, what's the tribulation? We can identify that. Uh, in the Doctrine of Covenants, the Lord says that he wants the missionaries to go out. Right? This is Imagine this is in the days of Joseph Smith where he's starting to organize the first missionaries. He's telling them to go out and gather in the house of Israel or the Gentiles into the church and to prepare their hearts to be prepared in all things against the day when tribulation and desolation are sent forth. He tells them in D.C. 88 to labor diligently for the last time to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment, which is to come, that their souls may escape the wrath of God. Now, anybody good with grammar and sentence structure? What just happened right there? What is the wrath of God? That comma created a synonym. Mm -hmm. And the synonym of the wrath of God is the desolation of abomination. So now by gaining that synonym, guess what we can do? We can identify what is the desolation of abomination or what are the preparatory events that lead to the desolation of abomination and better understand why the Lord would tell us in Matthew 24 and in Mark and in Luke to be ready to see that thing, right? He says, when you see it standing where it ought not, Daniel says it gets set up. And the Lord seems to indicate that we should be ready to identify the moment in which we see the desolation, right? And what is that? It's the wrath of God. When we see these things, we should understand what they mean. <laughs> you know, the Lord tells Joseph, he tells him exactly when it's going to come, after the testimony of the elders of the church, Right? And, and you can maybe argue the first elders of the church. Then cometh wrath and indignation, earthquakes, starting to sound familiar. This is the Lord's conversation with his disciples, repeated now in the latter days with greater clarity. In DNC 88, thunderings, lightnings, tempests, the waves of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds. All things shall be in commotion. Men's hearts shall fail them and fear shall come upon all people. 2 Nephi 6 will actually recite, uh, it, it's Jacob's recitation of the tribulations from the perspective of Isaiah. Now what's interesting, and I, I can't go into this tonight, but study 2 Nephi chapters 1 through 5. It's a temple preparation class that Lehi gives his sons. And then Jacob follows up with 2 Nephi 6, after we go through this temple prep class given by Lehi to his sons. And what's wonderful about 2 Nephi 1 through 5 is the temple preparation uh, class is specifically revolving around the promised land. So it's tied to covenants on the land of America. Now, Watch what Jacob says, and, and whenever you see kind of odd things in Scripture, that's when you either have a chance to prove they're not true, or there is something so unique here it becomes proof that they are. He says, now imagine who Jacob is talking to. Who's he speaking to? Literally. His family. His, yeah, his, his brother's people, right? Yeah. Or, or his father's people, maybe. And, and so, think about, think about, like, actually being there and being in the audience with Jacob saying this to you. I would speak unto you concerning the things which are and which are to come. Wherefore, I will read you the words of Isaiah. Now, the words which I shall read are they which Isaiah spake concerning all the house of 